water, food, cities, wealth, transportation, and war all share an essential partner, energy. Power Trip, a new documentary series available on PBS and Amazon Prime, focuses on the nexus of energy in these six areas. It's based off the book Power Trip written by Dr. Michael Weber. I remember when the book first came out, I was supposed to go to a book signing but ended up being out of town. So I had my coworker Erin Otan pick me up a copy. I was stoked when she finally gave it to me. I recently chatted with Dr. Michael Weber and series director Matt Hames on a Zoom call about the release of their new documentary series. Um, okay, so let's get into some of the questions um, that I have prepared for you. Let's talk about Power Trip and just more in general energy and education. Dr. Weber, I know that's something that you're really focused on. And then Matt, I'd love to hear from you, just kind of your experience making uh, the series. So Dr. Weber, I'll start with you first. It's very clear that you have passion for energy and energy education. Where did that come from? So the interest in energy started a long time ago when I was in college. It was around my freshman year in college that I started to understand energy and water to be fundamental ingredients in civilization and modern society. So I developed an interest in it then. Then uh, finished college, went off to grad school, did some work that was related to combustion and combustion's at the heart of energy. That's burning things as combustion. So I got some practical hands-on experience and knowledge of energy, then started moving to energy policy and then really wanted to do energy research and energy education. So energy's been a part of my interest for a couple of decades now, but as a part of my profession, maybe just 15, 20 years. And Matt, I think it's clear that you have a passion for filmmaking. I know that this isn't your first venture into this. Where did your passion for filmmaking come from? Um, well, when you say the word passion, I tend to think about love and lust. And so the lust phase for me was probably when I was young and I was watching Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, Indiana Jones movies and Star Wars and stuff like that. Um, and then I would say the, the love, um, if you will, the more meaningful experience started after I actually had experiences and had opportunities. Um, and I started making a documentary in 2005 about World War II um, escape lines in, in Belgium and in Europe. And just kind of fell in love with the people and fell in love with the idea of telling a true story um, and then taking a complex subject and making it simple for people to understand and follow. So that's actually where my, my lust for film kind of turned into the love. And I guess you could be passionate in love or lust, but I don't know if that answers your question. It does, it does. Uh, Dr. Weber, Matt just said something that leads to my next question. Um, he, he said that he likes taking complex things and making them simple for people to understand. I think that's very relevant to energy today. So can you talk about just some of the challenges we're facing in terms of today's energy system? Yeah, and I say this is a thing that Matt and I have in common. I think that makes uh, us a good team for working together and I really enjoy working with him because he has a similar interest in making complex subjects accessible or easy to understand. And there are many complex subjects in the world. Energy environment's one of them, but there's also national security or healthcare. There are a lot of complex subjects. And he makes complex subjects more accessible in film for, form or video form you know, with a very visual storytelling style. And I tend to do it more in written form, maybe sometimes spoken form. So together, it's a similar interest, um, but complementary approach. And for me with energy environment, it's very complex because it touches so many things. It touches every sector of society, it's hidden right in front of our eyes. It's a part of our daily lives, whether we know it or not. And so there's a lot of mystery to reveal to people as you explain energy and then try to make it simple and maybe less scientific or less scary for people to make it really accessible. That's really an interest and passion of mine. Matt, one of my uh, coworkers had a really interesting question. Hi, Matt. My name is Dylan. Uh, I really appreciate the work you're doing. I'm just curious, uh, how do you go about making a documentary on a subject that is more or less invisible. I mean, once you've used the B-roll of a Van der Graaff generator once, where do you go from there? I'm interested how you construct that visually and craft an interesting narrative out of that um, from something that seems mundane to people. I think that's a cool question. I think about immediately what I think about is um, magic, like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, things like that. They have magic in them, but you don't really see the magic unless it's interacting with other things. 
So, um, and, and Michael actually has this metaphor in his book that I really liked where he talked about energy being kind of like magic. Um, you don't really see it unless you are seeing it in action, like how it affects or how it impacts things. So for instance, um, you might see how transportation changed over time because of energy and that's very visual. Or you might see how like modern surgery is only possible because of modern energy, like surgery back in, but you know, before modern energy, people were dripping hot candle wax into w open wounds and, you know, you're bleeding on the floor with sawdust everywhere and you can only operate during the day and uh, people didn't understand germ theory and things like that. And all those things are visual. So you kind of have to, like if you're making a film about love or magic or any of these other kind of invisible attributes, you have to see how they actually interact with things. And I really like how they interact with history. So I was like definitely pushing a strong history angle with this series. Dr. Weber, in that vein, um, Matt talking about how you can only show how energy interacts with things. You can't show energy itself. My coworker, Aaron Otan, had a question for you. Hey, Dr. Weber, Aaron Otan here. Um, I really appreciate how your books and this series take complicated topics and make them really easily digestible. Uh, so my question for you today is what is something that is not common knowledge that should be about how energy affects people's lives? One example that's often a surprise for people is how much electricity is embedded in our water system. So we use electricity to pump the water from the source, which might be a river or lake, to a treatment plant. And then electricity is used at the treatment plant. Then the water usually flows downhill, maybe it's pumped up to a storage tank and then to your house. And then it flows through your house where we might heat it again with electricity. And then it goes down the drain when we're done with it, we flush it or wash it down the sink or wherever it goes down the sewage pipes to the wastewater treatment plant where electricity is used again for lights and blowers and pumps and things like that to treat the wastewater before it's returned to the river. So there's electricity all up and down that water supply chain from source through our home to the destination where it's returned to the water systems. And that electricity overall for water in the state ends up being pretty significant. We end up using more electricity for our water system in the United States than for all our light bulbs combined. And so in our house, we'll use more energy for our water, in our taps and sinks and hoses and water heaters than we use for all the light bulbs in our house. And that's an unusual thing or a hidden thing about energy where it's there, but we don't know it because it's behind the wall and the water heater or maybe you know, several miles away at a power plant, that kind of thing. Matt, I'd imagine as you're trying to kind of capture this whole ecosystem, you had to go quite a few different places to film. How many different places, how many different locations were used to film Power Trip? Um, I think around 42. That could be not exactly accurate, but I'm just going to go with 42 because of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think that's like the answer to everything, life, the universe, and everything. And so yeah, we went to Singapore, Japan, Israel, Ireland, uh, the UK, uh, um, I don't know, help me, Michael, where else did we go? Lots of places. France, California, Texas, New York, Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, so a lot of places. Yeah. And what would you say were some of just the biggest, biggest challenges you faced during filming, Matt? Well, I think um, my, maybe Michael would agree that filming in Singapore during the rainy season was not the easiest thing. Uh, we, we filmed outside and Michael was scheduled to get this uh, tour that we were gonna film. And it just, this torrential downpour came and it was not just raining, but it was also very hot and very humid and muggy. So our camera equipment kept fogging up and we would have to set the lens outside and kind of like let the, de the condensation kind of go away over time. Um, but we ended up getting some good, good moments out of that. But I would say the weather, the other weird thing was that we went to Israel and part of the angle of our story in Israel was that it's a, you know, it's a water constrained place, uh, lots of desert and water is very difficult to get. Well, it rained every day we were in Israel. So <laughs> you just can never predict the, the weather, but we, we filmed outside anyway. We had a scene in London with a horse-drawn carrot vibe. Yeah. And as we're getting into the horse-drawn carrot, it started to hail. And it does not hail in London very often. So then we had to, think about hats and umbrellas, other things. And by the time we figured that out, it quit hailing and then we had to go back. So there, there was a lot of unpredictability with little things like that as well. Yeah. So there was the rain in Singapore, the hail in London. 
Um, is there any, are there any other stories that stick out in your mind when you were filming, things that you'll take with you as you look back on this project in the next few years or for the rest of your life? And Dr. Weber, I'll let you go first. The, the whole thing was really amazing, and it's hard to know what my favorite was, but one scene that I really enjoyed was filming on the boat, on the river in Chicago for the architectural tour of the city. Chicago has really interesting architectural history. It's really the book of the skyscraper. And when you're on the river looking up, you get a unique angle at it, and there's just a lot of great history. So I actually thought all the things we filmed, that was the most fun because I was just a student learning the whole time, and it was just a unique way to see the city. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, there were so many places that we went, kind of like what Michael was talking about, where there were things that I really wanted to to see and do and spend more time doing. Like in Chicago, the Architecture Foundation Museum um, had just opened, and it's actually, you can do an architecture tour on a boat, but we also went inside to the, the new museum, and they have this um, massive cityscape, but all built out of models, like, you know, these like these amazing models of skyscrapers. Um, I wanted to spend more time there. Uh, Minneapolis has this really interesting place called the Mill City Museum, which has all these like cool experiments that you can do where you can make your own uh, flour and like try to grind it yourself. Um, and then uh, also create a gas explosion with flour. And so there's all these really, really weird things that it's like, so a lot of times you go to a, on a field trip or something as a kid and you think it's boring. These were all like cut all the boring parts out. These were all the cool parts. Um, but we didn't have enough time to really um, spend, you know, doing that. And I would say that, like, in general, that's the biggest challenge to making the series is that um, you're talking about so many different things and you're trying to cover so many bases, but you're also trying to make a show that doesn't feel like it's just checking boxes. Um, and so I think someone once talked about filmmaking as being like building a watch. You have to cram all these, like, tiny little pieces into a very small space, and they all have to work flawlessly together. And fortunately, we had a roadmap with Michael's book where he'd already done the heavy lifting. But then kind of once you get out in the world and you're having to make all that visual, um, then it's, you know, it's just really, uh, it's difficult to figure out what to leave out and what to put in. Well, I've watched, I, I think as, as we are recording this interview today, two episodes have been released. Is that correct? Yes. And Water that's food. Water and food, yes, I've actually watched them both, and I've heard actually Dr. Weber talk about um, the Water Energy Nexus quite a few times at conferences and, and other areas. I hadn't heard of him talk about food as much, so I actually did learn a lot during the food episode. Dr. Weber, I saw you grinding the flour and complaining about how much you got done in 15 minutes. Um, so that brings a question to mind. You guys also had a lot of fabulous um, interviewees that participated in the series, uh, along with Dr. Weber. Did either of you learn anything while filming, or is there anything that you learned while conducting another interview that you weren't expecting to learn, something that sticks out to you, Dr. Weber? Uh, so, yeah, great question. Even though I wrote the book and I study and teach energy for a living, I learn significant things in every episode. Even on the Energy Water Nexus, which I've studied the most, I still picked up a few things about the history of water and civilization. And there are different stories along the way. I, I learned how much food is consumed at West Point by the 4,000 cadets. Some phenomenal numbers there and what it takes uh, to get that done. Even though I knew about desalination, I learned details about the size of the desalination plant in Israel. We visited the historic aqueduct in Caesarea in Israel. It was really fascinating. I think the episode I learned the most in was probably the security episode with things like the Red Ball Express, which you don't know about yet because the episode had not been released. But uh, stay tuned for episode six on war or security. There are some really interesting tidbits that I didn't know that helped shape my thinking about energy in very useful ways. Yeah, I would add. Um to that episode that he's talking about, um, which is the last episode, episode six, um, there was a really cool thing right here in Texas, uh, the Big Inch and the Little Big Inch, and it was these pipelines that were built uh, to bring oil and natural gas from Texas all the way up to the Eastern seaboard during World War II. Um, and that was because the Germans kept sinking uh, ships that were trying to transport fuel um, to the East Coast. And so um, this pipeline was built in an amazingly short amount of time 
Um, and it was almost like building the pyramids. It just seems like such a huge thing to do. Um, and they did it super quickly right here in East Texas. And growing up, like I, I grew up in Texas and I never learned about that. And I feel like that's a cool thing to, that we should learn about in, in history. Like people in New York City, you know, turning on their, their burner on their stove and it's natural gas from Texas coming out. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I grew up in Texas. I still, I've lived in Texas my whole life and I, that's never popped up in any type of history lesson that I've taken. Well, thank you both for joining me today. Dr. Weber, I did want to show you because I honestly forgot that this is just sitting right here available. It is my copy of Power Trip. I love to see that. Uh, I hope uh, you like the book and I hope other people like it and I'll have to sign it for you if I've never signed it for you. You haven't. And the funny story about this book is my co my coworker, Erin, who I mentioned earlier, her and one of the other people in our Austin based team went to your book signing. It was either at UT or maybe at the book people on on South Lamar and she would sent me the date for the book signing a week ahead in advance and she said I know you want to go to us go to this let's go to this I ended up being down she grabbed a copy of the book for me and I actually took a video of her handing me my copy of the book so I'm gonna to try to find that and get that uh, linked into this interview I was really excited to say the least but yeah you, you still uh, need to sign up for me but I, I did really enjoy it so Thank you for talking with me today, Dr. Weber. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. And Matt, thank you for joining us. I really appreciated your perspective on filmmaking. We do talk to a lot of energy experts, uh, smart city experts, not really too many people from the creative arts. So thank you for bringing that perspective to this interview. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.